Hi everyone, welcome to another discussion of China and in this uh, video especially I want to talk about how Ukraine, uh, the whole crisis around Ukraine including the sanctions, including uh, the geopolitical situation impacts China. Last time I did a video on the economic aspect, a bit more like internal, uh, maybe a bit the smaller picture. This time I want to take it a bit bigger and talk about diplomacy. And in the future I plan to do a third video which will be about the geopolitical changes that start to take shape, that start to become more and more clear that they will happen. And um, I will talk how that how those changes will impact China. But today I want to talk about diplomacy. A few words about Beijing before I start, as always. So today is the last day of the Qingming Festival that I've mentioned last time, that is commemorating uh, the dead, the ancestors. And in the morning when I went running, I saw a few people burning uh, what's called paper money. It doesn't necessarily have to be money, but it's like a paper that has like sacrificial objects printed on it and it's like the tradition or superstitious belief if you want or religion or whatever you want to call it that you sacrifice these objects to give it to the ancestors in the afterlife where they can make use of these paper cell phones and money and whatever's printed on that paper um, and so I took a short video. I don't, I really don't like taking videos of people doing any, any spiritual activities. I always find intruding into these kind of activities very rude. So I just took it from a bit afar to show you how it looks like. And it's usually done at crossroads because apparently the belief is that ghosts are most likely to find you when you're at the crossroads. And so they burn this and they always draw a circle around the place where they, where they burn these uh, sacrificial papers. Um, and that's just if you ever get to go to China or if you are in China at the moment. If you see these circles on the ground, they're usually either in white or in black crayon. Um, try not to step on them. I mean, I'm not superstitious. I don't believe the part that there's the ghost inside. But it's, it's more like a respect for the culture. Chinese people, many Chinese people avoid stepping onto these circles. And I just feel it's like respecting their traditions, respecting their culture, not to step into these circles. So <laughs> that was the cultural three minutes. Um, let me get to the main topic of this video, which is the diplomacy. And um, there's been a lot of diplomacy going on worldwide, not just the Chinese. Uh, maybe if you're following the news, you've seen how many European uh, politicians have traveled around the world. Uh, the U.S. foreign uh, diplomas, diplomatic staff is, is traveling around the world. And so are the Chinese, the Russians as well. India is more sitting back and welcoming everyone, but everyone is going to India right now. Um, so let's look at just the foreign ministry of China. Here's a list where just in last week what has been published by the foreign ministry of China and you can see first of all it's a lot <laughs> um, second of all if you look closer you'll notice that a lot is about uh, several topics and the main topic that covers a lot is uh, this conference in, in Twin Si. Twin Si is not a place you have to know it's in, in western China in Anhui province and um, it was actually a series of three conferences within two days and followed by a number of one-on-one -on -one meetings by the Chinese foreign minister with the invited foreign uh, ministers of the other countries. And um, the topic of these conferences was Afghanistan, uh, the topic that has been completely pushed out of the Western news cycle, obviously because of, of the crisis in Ukraine. But um, it's a very dire situation in Afghanistan after the Americans basically ran out. Um, we can call it flee, we can call it withdraw. Um, they didn't just go, they uh, added sanctions and <laughs> confiscated the national treasury of Afghanistan, small as it was, um, which really just, I mean, 
I don't want to become judgmental of, of the West or anything, but it, it creates, just exacerbates the suffering after 20 years of, of war and occupation and uh, all the challenges Afghanistan faces, the last thing they needed is sanctions. And as nobody else is, is taking Afghanistan in their hands, it's kind of up to the Chinese to, to, to push the topic. And so this is what the Twin Sea Conference was about. And the main meeting was with the neighbors of Afghanistan. So it's two meetings. One is just the neighbors and then one is the neighbors plus Afghanistan themselves. The reason why they're held two meetings separately is that the, the government of Afghanistan is still uh, kind of a de facto kind of not official government, the Taliban government, which took power militarily by defeating what was left of the American supported government of Afghanistan that was uh, internationally recognized. And although on the ground the facts are made, the Taliban are the uh, clear leaders in, in Kabul, in, in Afghanistan, um, they're not yet internationally recognized and the Chinese are very, very careful about these, these uh, diplomatic details. So they would not have an official meeting with, uh, the Af with the Taliban unless they fully recognize the Taliban government. So it was more like a, we meet with the de facto government, um, de facto foreign minister, but we don't say that we recognize him. So they're very careful not to, to uh, cross that line. Although I'm, I'm rather sure sooner or later they will officially recognize uh, the uh, Taliban government in Afghanistan. But I'm equally sure they will not do it alone. And I think that was one part of the Twin Sea conference, um, which included the foreign ministers of the neighbors of Afghanistan. Um, let me think if I can get them together. So it's um, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Iran, Pakistan and China. Um, and I put a map up because I'm aware that most listeners are probably not very familiar with the exact location of these countries. Um, but they're all neighbors and Russia in addition. I don't know exactly where Russia was in there. It's called the neighbors of Afghanistan, but Russia was present in, in those meetings. It's the third round of these neighbors of Afghanistan's uh, foreign minister meetings. And uh, anyway, what's what's really relevant for me is one, these countries, seven quite different countries, including um, Sunni countries like Pakistan, Shia countries like Iran, uh, conservative uh, Orthodox uh, country like Russia, plus the non-monotheistic, non-religious, secular uh, country China. They came up with a statement and um, it's quite a long statement. It's a quite detailed statement um, out of the conference. So this conference obviously was quite a success. They agree on several points. They put pressure on the US to lift sanctions and return Afghans money. They also agree on helping and assisting Afghanistan in rebuilding the economy and reintegrating into international politics and trade. And um, on the sidelines of those conferences that took place, um, they, the Chinese foreign minister Wang Yi, he also met with each of the foreign ministers in one-on-one -on -one meetings. So that's a very convenient method for high efficiency diplomacy. You invite all the seven foreign ministers, or, or the, yes, yeah, six foreign ministers plus the de facto foreign minister to China, discuss an issue of common interest, because all neighbors obviously have a huge interest that Afghanistan stabilizes. Worst case is to have like this festering crisis that never ends and, and have uh, violence and a hotbed for terrorism. Um, it's much better to have a Taliban government that stabilizes, that is recognized by all the neighbors, cooperates with the neighbors to fight more extreme groups. <laughs> Who would have thought that we would say that 20 years ago, huh? 
but um, the Taliban are fighting the more extreme groups like IS and, and other uh, really extreme uh, Islamist extremist groups. And so it's, it's in the interest of all the neighbors to make sure that Afghanistan stabilizes also for humanitarian reasons. Nobody likes to see people starving just across one's border. And if you're very cynical, you just say, well, they don't want to see them starving because they will be refugees. And even that's true. I mean, nobody wants to see an ongoing crisis just across one's own border. So, so they have a big interest to work together and um, on the sidelines, China meets with each of them one-on-one. -on -one. Russia also uses the opportunity to improve the relations or keep good relations with them. And you'll see that uh, none of these countries have obviously um, condemned Russia for uh, the situation in Ukraine. I say obviously because if you've followed my last video, you'll know that except Europe and the US and Australia, the only country that also sanctions Russia is, is uh, Japan. So, so really in Asia there's almost nobody sanctioning Russia and even condemning their, their quite lackluster uh, if they condemned at all. So I think Singapore as well, uh, just to be precise, I think Singapore has some very mild sanctions put on Russia as well. So I, I might be wrong there. Um, but anyways, main gist is, is um, China has effectively met with the whole Western region, like the West, Great Western Area, as it's called from a Chinese perspective, um, to the west of China. And before last week, they've also had meetings with uh, Qatar, with Saudi Arabia. Famously, um, they've apparently discussed with Saudi Arabia to buy oil in, in Reminbi, which would be a, a huge blow for the for the dollar, uh, for the petrodollar. Mm, a topic definitely for that geopolitical video that I'm planning to do next. Um, in, in terms of diplomacy, so that was one thing. Another thing is Southeast Asia. So Wang Yi has spoken with Indonesia, with Thailand, with Nepal. And with Thailand, they even came up with a joint statement uh, with Myanmar as well. All countries that not all, uh, Myanmar and Thailand specifically, they feel very much under pressure from the US. In Myanmar, you probably know that there's this internal struggle, there's this, uh, uh, could call it civil war almost, um, where Western-backed rebels are fighting the, the government dictatorship. And in Thailand, if, I f if you follow New Atlas, which is a channel that I highly recommend, uh, you, you'll see that also in, in Thailand, the US is very active in, in um, trying to change the country's constitution, trying to change society. So, so they also feel probably not that positively about the US. And that's a theme that will recur time and again. So many places where uh, the US has recently put pressure on and now they come and say, hey, you should help us um, you know, punish Russia which makes you feel like, what are they thinking? You cannot just put pressure on a country and then um, imagine they'll help you against your enemy. Uh, and the most extreme case is obviously China itself because the West has been attacking China heavily for years with, you know, with massive tariffs from Trump's time, and then, then uh, sanctions on individuals. Just recently, um, the US have announced some sanctions against Chinese individuals, which is, it doesn't hurt China very much. And those individuals probably didn't have plans to travel to the US anyways, but it's an affront. It's an attack, it's an emotional, uh, it's an insult. And you cannot insult the country and then expect it to help you against its own ally <laughs> because that ally is your enemy. Um, so, yeah, so that was Southeast Asia. Um, the foreign minister also had a call with the uh, European unions, um, uh, Josep Borrell, as well as, for me, important, the Swiss foreign minister. And I, I've read the readout from the Swiss uh, uh, foreign minister's uh, call with China. It sounds like there was relatively good 
atmosphere of the talks. I mean, Chinese common people were shocked and outraged how Switzerland joined in confiscating Russian uh, individuals' money. I've read thousands of comments on my Chinese channel uh, on, on why is Switzerland not neutral anymore. Switzerland's done for, Switzerland's doomed. They've wasted all the trust. You cannot rebuild it. But I think um, the Chinese government is much more pragmatic. They have no reason to worry about some oligarchs' money if it's safe in Switzerland. Um, the Swiss have assured China that they're, they continue to be neutral and that they support um, negotiations using the famous Swiss uh, diplomacy that has indeed a history of supporting difficult negotiations between sworn enemies. However, I'm a bit confused how the Swiss imagine that they can do this mediating role while also sanctioning one party of the conflict. That just kind of doesn't make sense to me, but that's my personal view. Apparently the call was fine. Um, yeah, so, so now let's look at some of the activities of the EU and uh, Europe and the US in terms of foreign politics, in terms of diplomacy. What I mean, I've, I've heard of Boris Johnson traveling to Saudi Arabia asking for oil and gas. I've heard of a German... Uh, what minister is he? Habeck is his name. I forgot what ministry he occupies, but he apparently traveled to Qatar, embarrassingly said he secured a deal for, for, for gas by, uh, from, from Qatar and Qatar denied that this deal was secured. I mean, that's just the level of, of amateurism is, is really embarrassing. And I don't mean that to, you know, bash against the West. I'm really not intent on, on, telling you how horrible the West is doing things. I say this with a huge concern for Europe, with a huge concern for the West, for, you know, the democratic system, the, the, the world that I've grown up in. I'm concerned that it ends. And I don't think it ends because Russia and China are so incredibly, overwhelmingly smart and, and great. I mean, I do have a great life in China and I have a very positive view of China, but that doesn't mean that the West would have to fall. The West is in a massive decline of its own making. That's my opinion and throughout my videos I will step by step explain why I get to this conclusion. Um, today we can look at some, uh, some, some foreign diplomacy steps which are just a wonderful case in point. So first um, I wanted to look at a statement from Miss von der Leyen, who is something like the representative, the head of the EU, as, as I think, what, what is she, the head of the EU Commission? Um, so she represents the EU and spoke to, to Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang, so to the highest two Chinese, the president and the foreign uh, and the prime minister. And I want to read this because it's such a telling statement. We, the European Union, are determined to support the multilateral order. Together with our international partners, we have taken action. We have adopted massive sanctions that are effective. So we also made very clear that China should, that China should, if not support, at least not interfere with our sanctions. This statement contains two points that I find very irritating, um, or three points. So the first one is, we have taken action with our international partners. Who are those partners? It's the US who actually pushed Europe to take this action. So it's not the EU who has taken action with the US. It's Europe has followed the US action. And then it's, it's Japan, the UK and Switzerland uh, as three countries I know of that aren't the EU and that are sanctioning Russia. So it's a tiny, it's a tiny uh, group of countries. If you talk about the international community, you should take, uh, you should take into consideration where 
60-70% uh, of the world population live. Countries like China, like India, like all of Africa, like Turkey even, a NATO member who refuses to sanction Russia. So, so yeah, who are those international partners? No, you haven't taken action with your international partners. You have joined the US and isolated yourself. And then the second thing, the sanctions that are working. Like, working for what? What is working about these sanctions? It's working, yes, all right. It's driving up oil and gas prices in Europe. It's spooking the German industry. It's uh, spooking everyone in Europe who has uh, heating with oil or gas. Uh, it, it drives up prices in Europe. Has it stopped the fighting in Ukraine? No, it hasn't. Has it impacted the fighting capability of Russia? No, it hasn't. Has it created unrest in Russia, kind of destabilizing the people behind the attack on Ukraine? No, it hasn't. On the contrary, Putin's popularity has exploded. <laughs> the New York Times even, even says as much. I don't but I wouldn't solely rely on, on Russian uh, surveys because obviously uh, Russia surveying its own population, there's always the possibility to influence and, and, and you know, manipulate the results. But New York Times reports from the ground in Russia saying that lots of people who oppose the war, who didn't like Putin, now just say, well, the sanctions just prove that the West is out to destroy Russia. And so if that's the case, then what we can do is rally around the flag, rally around our leader, support Vladimir Putin fighting back against the Western attacks on Russia. So yeah, the sanctions are working, but definitely not in the way that Ms. von der Leyen is, is trying to imply, because they're not achieving anything that Europe would want to achieve. And um, the third point is, for example, Bloomberg puts the headline, von der Leyen warns China. Warns China. It's this, you mustn't do this or that or else kind of mentality. And you can do that when you're like the big bully, when you're like strong and powerful. Yeah, you can go. It's not nice, but people do it. Countries do it. I mean, strong countries, they do bully smaller countries all the time and they do demand things and they do demand that countries uh, take certain steps. But Europe towards China is at the moment not in a position to demand things and threaten China and, and go on this, you do as I say or else. Because when your energy prices are going through the roof, your main source, 40% of your oil, um, is cut off because of your own sanctions. And the Arabs who have large amounts of oil refuse to increase their production to support you. Then you don't go to the world's biggest producer of virtually all manufactured goods and tell them you do as I tell you or else. Like, what is she thinking? I don't, I don't get what, what she's uh, trying to achieve with such language because the Chinese have had it. I mean, the Chinese, they're a proud people. They have a history of feeling humiliated by a superior military power of the West for more than a century. And in the moment when Europe gets weak, the, Europe, the, the Chinese are still open to work with Europe. They admire a lot of uh, the achievements of Europe in terms of culture, in terms of liberties, of economic freedom, of economic um, success. But they've had it being talked down to by people who imagine they're superior, even though now factually, economically, they're not anymore. So definitely that's a very weird tactic. And by the way, in the same statement, um, it says uh, Europe acknowledges that at the moment 25% of the Chinese population are in lockdown. I've talked about this recently. And I don't know where she gets the number. 25% of the Chinese population. That would be, what, 300 million? 300 million Chinese in lockdown currently? Where? I mean, The Guardian reports 37 million. That was before Shanghai got into lockdown. Assuming that everybody else is still in lockdown, we get to around 50 million. 
that's that's less than five percent that's nowhere near 25 percent so i don't know what she said there and why the eu wrote that into their um, write-up of the call but it's embarrassing it's just embarrassing when you say things that are just making you look uninformed because the chinese know it's not true i mean yeah they know their numbers anyway so that was that call by van der Leyen. then who else do i want to look at um africa so both uh, anthony blinken and victoria newland um, are doing tours in africa and again it's this pattern where china calls countries up to say hey stay neutral stay with us let's do trade let's do business what can we do to support you uh, what kind of investment do you need? Uh, what kind of projects do you want to uh, talk about finance? How can you finance it? Uh, all these discussions, and China does that with the, with the self-interest, obviously, but it's not a stupid self-interest. It's not like, do what I tell you, sanction Russia and hurt yourself while giving me more gas. It's a self-interest of, you know, how can we build up your country so you become a customer for us? Uh, how can we invest in your country so that returns on investment flow, flow back to us? These are win-win proposals where any country is always eager to talk about those. And if you don't believe me, I mean, Switzerland, uh, your country probably as well, they all have representative offices specifically to attract foreign investment from China. And so foreign investment is not a trap. I mean, it can turn into a trap if you don't manage your country well but first of all it's it's an opportunity to grow your economy all right uh, before i get too far on a tangent so what did um yeah blinken in africa just very quickly what i've read is that he was trying to to secure oil and gas for europe which sounds like noble cause trying to support his allies in europe well yeah, but he was also the one, and I mean, not he, he represents the administration who pressured Europe into shooting its own foot by sanctioning Russia. So, so yeah, the noble cause, maybe you could have started earlier, right? You could have started last December when, when your administration was warning the world that Russia was about to invade and, and, and bragging about how crippling sanctions would destroy Russia. You might have used the time you still had back then to prepare for how Europe can cope with such sanctions if they don't instantly work and bring down Putin within a week. But you didn't. So now you're running through Africa trying to find oil. And um, yeah, here's the irony. He met with Algeria, whose foreign minister he refused to meet at the uh, United Nations General Assembly. Always great to refuse to meet people and then when you need something, uh, try to meet them and say, hey, can you help me? <laughs> yeah, not very uh, comfortable situation to be in. But um, let's go to Victoria Nuland, who's a, a, a vice foreign minister and um, who's not just some, 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 you know, Congress backbencher politician. She's supposed to be one of the top notch heavyweight diplomats of the US. And here's a statement that I've read from her, which again, I want to just uh, focus a bit and, and read one line that's just blown me away, which is, we built this order. She's talking about the, the, uh, the international rules-based order. And she's saying, we built this order together and it's made us more free, safer and prosperous over 70 years. I I'm paraphrasing, but th that's the gist of what she's saying. Now think about what that is from an African perspective. 70 years ago, so we're talking 1950, when vast parts of Africa are colonies of Europe. They're colonies of France, of England, uh, other places. And um, the Europeans set up a world order together with the US and uh, the, the, the already defeated Chinese, mm, I'm inclined to say puppet regime, but that's not fair. I mean, the, the Chinese Kuomintang, Chiang Kai-shek, the nationalist uh, regime that already was fleeing to Taiwan, but um, represented China when the United Nations were set up. 
Um, so, so yeah, these uh, but main forces definitely. The Soviet Union was also involved because, after all, they did the bulk of defeating the Nazis. But um, so, the, the 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 Western powers were the driving force of setting up the new world order after World War II with the United Nations. And they didn't free Africa. They didn't, in this new world order that they set up, give equal rights to, to black African countries. They considered them still a part of colonial empires. And the bloody war where the Africans, both black African, sub sahara African, as well as North African Arab countries, fought bloody wars, horrible wars, to free themselves of the occupation of the colonialization so that was this world order that we built, but this we just simply does not include Africa because African nations did not have uh, any influence. They didn't have the power and they weren't given any power by the West at the time when the West built that new order. Uh, so it wasn't me, we. <laughs> and it hasn't made us free because what's made Africa free is, is the, the, the pure fighting power of the African people. I mean, how they fought apartheid in South Africa. That was within this already established new world order that has made the US free and safer and whatnot. It hasn't made South Africa free. It made South Africa an occupied apartheid country where a few, like a small white minority, horribly oppressed the black uh, majority. So yeah, has it made us free? Yeah, us in the sense of the West, but not us of the sense, uh, in the sense of we, uh, US and Africa. Uh, what was the next, next word she used? Prosperous. Yeah, how much has the world order made Africa prosperous? Go back to 1990. Go back to 1960. That's when this world order was in place, was fully working, was working well for the West. Was Africa prosperous? Really? When did Africa start to get more and more prosperous? I mean, you can argue Africa is still not prosperous, but at least there's economic development. And the real development has been coming for the last maybe 10, 20 years, when China started to more and more invest in Africa. Now, Africa is a huge continent, huge population, vast number of countries, so I'm not going to uh, simplify into one, two sentences. I'm aware that it's very complex why Africa is now doing better. Um, but it's certainly not because of the world order that the US and the West has set in place 70 years ago. That's definitely not the reason why Africa in the last uh, 10, 20 years finally sees some progress in some regions. And um, yeah, made us safer. Yeah, exactly. Remember who killed the leader of a sovereign state just a few years back. You know, you remember the name Muammar al-Gaddafi? Al-Gaddafi was considered a terrorist, a horrible person by the West. And the West felt that they can abuse a United Nations approved no-fly zone to completely destroy Gaddafi's army bombard his palace, try to kill him, and support rebels that ultimately did kill him. Well, who was he? I mean, I'm not saying he was a nice person, I'm not saying he led a liberal democracy in, in Libya, but he invested huge resources, both time and money. Libya is an oil-rich country, it was a very rich country before it got bombarded into civil war and eternal fighting and destruction. He used that money to finance the building of the African Union. He even suggested to build an African currency backed by Libyan oil that would replace the dollar for inter-African trade. Some people speculate that's the true reason why the US and the West wanted to destroy Libya and kill Gaddafi, because he, he threatened the petrodollar. Um, in, in any case, he spent vast amounts of money to build a more prosperous and especially a more independent Africa. He was killed illegally by an illegal war launched by the US and NATO. So yeah, that's the world order that's made us safer. So what, what Victoria Newland basically is proposing to Africa 
is we've killed one of your heroes, broken our own rules, but now that Russia breaks the same rules, but in a way that doesn't hurt Africa, now we want you to condemn Russia. And that's in your own interest. What? Like what? Like how? Like how? How can she think that such a statement convinces people in Africa? It's, it's an affront. It's an insult to the intellect of African people. Of course it's not working. And it's shocking to see that this is supposed to be a heavyweight diplomat. This level of ignorance, of, of lack of self-reflection, what the US have done to Africa or not done to Africa in the last 70 years, and then tell them that they've built a system that has worked well and made Africa prosperous and safe and free. It's just unbelievable. And yeah, there we are. The highly professional Chinese uh, international diplomacy. And I'm not just talking of Wang Yi. I mean, Li Keqiang, the prime minister, and Xi Jinping as well, the, the president and and the uh, general secretary of the communist party of china they all engage in foreign diplomacy they all talk to everyone and one very notable visible visit was was uh, the foreign minister wang yi going to india the indian china uh, relationship is very 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 long very complex so it's definitely not uh, uh, a topic for this video it's way too complex but it's obvious that the neutrality of India is, is a reason for, for China to, to make this step and try to, to mend things with India after a border conflict that has seen several people dead. Uh, you know, I, again, I don't want to get into the details. But, and, and also I'm not uh, implying that this relationship is now all good. Uh, it's, it's definitely not yet, but it's a first step and also the Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov, he also went to India. And I heard um, Liz Truss of the UK was also in India. And apparently they were all, within one or two days, they were all in India at the same time. <laughs> India, Indian uh, news channels uh, do feel uh, rightfully proud to some extent how much attention India suddenly gets. What I found very interesting and important is that Lavrov, the Russian Foreign Minister, was the only one who got to see the uh, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Um, it wasn't expected for Wang Yi because there has been this strong tension between China and India, but it's a clear sign that India, India's uh, Prime Minister welcomes the Russian Foreign Minister, yet does not see uh, the, uh, the English diplomat visiting India. And again, if you look back in history, what India has done, no, sorry, what the UK has done in India, how the UK has hurt India over centuries, and how little, um, little um, apology has come India's way, how can they expect that India would stand on the UK side, on the West side against Russia, which always, even before, in, in, during Soviet times, has had good relations with India. So why should they go against their long-term trusted friend to support somebody who has exploited them over centuries, has seen a dramatic decline in economic power of India during the time it was colonized? relative to uh, the West's economic power rise in the same time. Why should they support the UK? Why should they support the West against Russia? It's not, it's not that simple. You cannot just talk about values, say democracy, democracy, uh, rules-based order, after you've broken those rules several times over the last two decades. If this invasion had happened in the 1990s by Russia, before the Yugoslavia war, then I think the West would really have this, this moral high ground to condemn it. But now, I think the world is waking up. And this is exactly going to be my next video. <laughs> I have to stop now, I'm already at 40 minutes. Um, so this is going to be the next video. The world is waking up, there are geopolitical changes 
coming that are way bigger than what China it, itself is doing or can be doing. It's, it's a global uh, change, but this change will have an impact on China. And I'll try to just, I mean, it's too early to say what really will happen, but I'll try to, to give it a shot what I think is, is about to happen and how that impacts China's position in the world. Thanks for watching. If you made it to here, <laughs> please do like and share. Uh, comment if you have any suggestions or uh, anything. Thanks for watching and see you next time.